Okay. Uh, you guys, thank you all for your attention. So, yeah. All right. So first, a few words of caution. So when you see, all right, you can take this. I'll give it later. Or you can take it too. No problem. <coughs> so uh, when you see in some places, you see that some floor is wet. You see a caution word, right? Uh, wet floor ahead. Enter ahead. So I'm telling you, it's a very dry lecture ahead. <laughs> so be prepared for it. Fasten your seatbelt very tightly. Um, but don't blame me for introducing this this year actually because it's, it's increasingly gaining a very uh, high importance in different countries in the field of self promotion and self promotion and self communication or behavior change communication. This is called proceed proceed model. Uh, it's not a theory, but it's a model. So we will learn what is the difference between the theory and the model. Uh, theories are more to explain the behavior, <coughs> to understand how a uh, person reacts to certain stimuli and this sort of thing. But model is more like a, a, a map. It's like a map. It, it has all the directions. You can take one direction. So single direction, single path, is the theory and the model is the whole map. You can pursue it in this way. Anyways, I'll go into that. But remember, I don't expect you to know or learn every bit and pieces of it. I myself don't know all those things. So what I'm trying to ask you is to concentrate more on the it has several steps. I will go into those steps. Five uh, nine steps in total. So each steps try to at least understand the parts of each step and try to remember the methodologies to uh, pursue all those steps. So this is the proceed proceed model, as I say. So this is actually a planning or implementation model. It's a planning or implementation model. Theories are not for implementing, right? It's for understanding. But models are to implement, how we want to implement it. That's the main idea of uh, the models that we are going to discuss. So, Proceed, proceed is like a road map. It's a map. You want to go from, suppose, from here to where? Suppose you want to go from Gulshan to uh, Newmarket. So you can go from different roads. You can go to University of Dhaka, you can go from uh, some other road. Or suppose you want to go from Dhaka to, suppose, Washington. You can take your stopover in uh, Istanbul, in uh, Dubai, in Frankfurt, wherever you want, but your destination is to achieve something, to go to reach somewhere, but you can take different paths. So the, the map, the road map is the uh, model, and the, the path, the specific path that you take, you can call it like a theory. I don't want to confuse you, these are not very important. Try to perceive. Uh, the most important thing is, as I said, complete the part of each of these uh, uh, the steps that we will be discussing. Then the roadmap map presents all the possible avenues and theories such as certain avenues to follow. Uh, it provides a structure for applying theories and concepts systematically for planning and evaluating. Planning and evaluating help in your change program. So it helps you to plan and to evaluate your program. Whereas the theory predicts or explains the relationship among factors what should be associated with outcome of interest. Suppose your outcome of interest is, can you give some example, what can be your outcome of interest, what you want to achieve? Yeah, give an example. No, give me an example. What you want to achieve through uh, health behavior change communication? Right, right, right. right. Very good example. I'll use this example. Uh, she said, suppose smoking cessation can be an outcome, right? <coughs> so the theories explain how can we. Uh, I mean, what are the factors associated with 
smoking, if I want to uh, uh, motivate someone to stop smoking, what are the behavioral factors that can that we can tap into? Those are the theories. But if we want to implement that theory to practice, we need a model to follow, which helps us to implement it and to evaluate it whether it is working or not. Very good example. Now the examples like uh, examples of uh, theory uh, models can be perceived process, social marketing, ecological model, and the theories can be. I mean, uh, I'm sure you have already been introduced to some of these uh, models. Though it's not health belief model, it's not a model. You know, it's just the name. They're calling it model because it was not at that time the model and theory and these sort of things. When it was introduced, it was not really distinguished at that time. Uh, so. This is a health belief model, theory of recent action, theories of plant behavior, diffusion of innovations, and there are numerous other theories too. So these are the theories and these are the models. So this is uh, the full meaning of um, the precip precip model. Predisposing, reinforcing, enabling, constructs in educational environmental diagnosis and evaluation. This is precip. And the precip is policy, regulatory, and organizational constructs in educational and environmental development. Don't try to uh, memorize it unless you want to impress your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> or boyfriend. <laughs> so, uh, this was developed in 1970 uh, by Green and Kreuzer. And I mean the prestige part. And the prestige part was later introduced or added to the, the previous prestige model in 1991. So, prestige is more uh, new approach. It was initially prestige. And the main idea of this precise proceed model is very. I mean, let me ask you something. Uh, suppose, how many of you are physicians? Okay. So, suppose a patient comes to you, him, him, right? Yeah. What do you do? What are the steps that you follow? No murmuring, no side talks. Yeah, tell me. I breathe in or out and after that, I then why? You do some, exactly, you ask, you take a history, then you do physical examination, then, then uh, before that you can do some other diagnostic tests too. So first you diagnose the problem, right? You don't give the treatment and then diagnose, right? You first do the diagnosis, you try to understand what's the problem, then what do you do? You give the treatment and then you try to evaluate, try to follow up, see the prognosis of that disease, whatever. So we do, do the diagnosis and then we do the treatment and we follow up. So the, 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 this idea is actually uh, used in precision model. Uh, so what we did do is we do uh, some diagnosis, educational diagnosis or diagnosis of the existing society or community or environment where you are planning to implement your program to try to understand that community first, to diagnose it from different angles or different perspectives, then, only then, you go and give your intervention. And after giving that intervention, behavioral intervention, suppose you educate people for smoking campaign, but you do some diagnosis of the community first, you do the smoking cessation campaign or health education or whatever you are planning, and then you evaluate. So that's the whole idea of proceed proceed model. It is as simple as that. Now, there are this model was developed to avoid certain traps. It's called health education trap. So what are those traps? First one is called the empty vessel trap. It assumes that, I mean previously, before the introduction of this proceed proceed model, and even now, few people think that the the people who we are going to give our intervention are empty-headed wisdom seekers. And we are the uh, like agents of wisdom going there and delivering our, or pouring uh, our wisdom inside their empty heads. It's actually not like that. They also have their own ideas, their own beliefs, own practices, knowledges. And you have to tackle that. You have to first understand that, what's in their head, and then deal with that. The second thing is a uh, technology trap. Sometimes we uh, we assume that certain educational methods are inherently superior than the others. Suppose I can assume that this PowerPoint is very I mean 
very good one instead of using something like that. That's more useful. And uh, this is called what? Flip chart. Yeah. So flip chart is not good, but in certain uh, scenarios, suppose in a village, maybe a flip chart is more applicable. So there is, I mean, we should not think that a certain uh, technology is better than others, right? And another trap is the grab back programming. Suppose I'm a uh, program planner or a consultant, you want to develop your uh, health education campaign, you come to me and tell me, look, I want to give some smoking cessation program, you tell me what I can do. I pour, put my hand in my bag and give you some medicines, not some medicines, some <coughs> ideas. Like I tell you, you do some focus group discussion, then you go uh, publish some posters and you do some theater, whatever. Or you simply go for counseling. So it's not, it should not be like that. Rather, you should understand what's the situation in the ground and you must have a proper justification for each of the interventions that you are planning. Why you are suggesting some counseling? Why you are suggesting some uh, other communication like a poster or maybe uh, the peer education? Whatever. whatever you are doing or whatever you are suggesting for an intervention uh, campaign, it must have a proper, well-defined, rational behind it. That's the whole idea to avoid this grab back programming. This slide is just the iteration of the same thing. We uh, it's the same thing that I discussed. So actually, the, uh, we do the health, we do this proceed proceed diagnostic. Some people call it just to avoid those uh, pitfalls. Now this is the proceed proceed framework. If you love a lot of arrows and uh, boxes. I tell you, you love this presentation. Otherwise, you may not love it. Uh, because it has plenty of boxes and arrows. But don't get intimidated. This is very simple. So, usually, as you can see, this is page 1, 2, 3, 4. So, it says that it actually goes from this way and then this way. But for your understanding, forget this way. We will go from left to right first. For your understanding. So, suppose... At this stage, forget these things. Just look at the middle part. We are giving some health education. We are changing the regulatory. Suppose, for uh, example, for your example of smoking cessation, uh, we are changing the regulatory framework, like we are banning the advertisement of uh, uh, tobacco products or whatever. I don't know. So we are giving some health education. We are changing the policy. And as a result of this change of policy and health education, we are expecting behavior change, a change in the behavior of the individuals, and also in the environment, through affecting the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors of this behavior and environmental factors, you know. So, let's go linearly, right? It's making it a little bit confused, uh, uh, confusing. So we are giving some health education and health regulation, or, uh, policy, of, um, policy regulation, these are acting on some predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors of behavior change or behaviors and environments. As a result of like our health education on these factors, these factors are getting affected. That is, the persons are, the people are changing their behavior or lifestyle. There is a change in the environment due, due to these uh, policy regulations and stuff. And as a result, they are have, uh, achieving a good health, and as a result of good health, they are having a better quality of life. That's the causal sequence of what we want to achieve. It's not what we do. This is what we want to achieve. This is what we uh, try for, um, I mean, we try through our um, health education campaigns, right? We do our health education to do this. So I'm telling again for the last time, we do health education and regulation to affect the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors, which predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors affect um, uh, affect the behavior or lifestyle or the environment, which changes the uh, health status. And as a result of change in health status, we are having a better quality of life. That's what we usually typically do through our health education campaigns or health 
education programs or communication programs. This is the typical way we do. So, there are some... Uh, now, what the... Uh, now we, we, we now understood what's happening there. Now we will do... We will explain the model. The model starts actually from here, not from here, because we do the assessment first. We do the... We do the diagnosis first. Then we give the treatment. So we cannot start from the treatment, right? We should start from the diagnosis. What's the situation here? What's the situation here? What's the situation here? What's the here? And then what's here and what we can give here actually. It's, it's actually overlapping. It's at the same time, it's an implementation. And at the same time, you have to understand the policy as well. Now, uh, OK, so this is the first state. We want to understand the we want to do the social assessment uh, and we need to understand the quality of life. So these are very important. Purpose. Okay? Try to remember those. Why we are doing each step. So first step was social assessment. The purpose of social assessment to gain insight into the community's ultimate values and perceived needs. I used this term yesterday as well. Perceived needs is not what you think. Is what the people in the community want or think that's necessary for them. So you try to understand those things. This is called social assessment. You want to understand the existing human resources and the assets. Human resources and the physical uh, physical resources. Previously, very old concept. Society was considered to have some negative attributes. Suppose a social scientist goes to uh, a community. If you ask the social scientist, what did you see in the community? The social scientist in the past would say, this community has a lot of crime rates, it may have, it doesn't have uh, illiteracy rate, illicit drug and prostitution and whatnot. And a lot of people are suffering from HIV on top of that. So now the approach is changed. Now we try to say that if you ask a social scientist, what do you see in, suppose, uh, in uh, for Islam, these people will say there are a lot of people living, struggling, a lot of resilience among them. Some students are still going to the to the uh, uh, schools, trying to learn, trying to build their future. There is a strong social network among them. Everybody knows what's happening in their surrounding. They're not uh, detached from each other. So these are the positive things that you need to appreciate. So you have to understand the what is the existing human and and other resources, the physical resources. And at the same time, you have to understand what are the potential barriers that you may face while you are trying to implement a program there. So these are part of the social assessment. Engage the community as active partner of the program development. You engage the community. That's also one objective of uh, the social assessment. If you don't do the social assessment, you simply go there and start your intervention. You may not, you may miss their perspective. So you do the social assessment to engage the people, make explicit the rationale for addressing a specific problem. Why you are doing this? But you should know. Those people should also know that why you are doing certain practice in the community. You are trying to introduce something in the community, right? And as a result, I, I said one thing, one important thing going back. The quality of life, uh, you, uh, what I'm telling now, right now, is not essential for your, uh, uh, for your um, exercise or assignment. This is, you can ask, what is quality of life? So there are two, what is quality of life? So quality of life is the perception of individuals and groups that, that need to be satisfied and that they are not being denied opportunities to pursue happiness and fulfillment. So if I translate in English, it's like uh, whether these people are uh, having the life that they want to live, the type of life that they want to live. So in order to understand that, what's the difference between health and quality of life? So the concept is say, uh, health as the health has an instrumental value. What is instrumental value? Health is, a, is an instrument for quality of life. Health by itself doesn't serve any purpose. You are healthy. 
doesn't mean anything. Rather, we want to be healthy because we want to enjoy our life. Suppose we want to enjoy our life. We want to have a good night's sleep. We want to have a very good uh, life standard, lifestyle. We want to enjoy our life, our youth, our... We want to uh, 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 pass a very productive youth, a uh, very peaceful, uh, elderly life. So these are the quality of life. The way we want to live is the quality of life. So health by itself doesn't take you much far. You know? It's just an attribute, it's an it's instrument. So we want to achieve health because it may ensure quality of life. Sometimes even a physical health does not ensure quality of life, right? So health is an instrument to reach the quality of life. And there is a reciprocal determinism, another concept. Don't try to memorize or anything. This is, this is just the uh, mechanism behind this uh, concept. So reciprocal determinism means health causes quality of life, quality of life causes health. So this determines this, this determines this, this is a circle. So this is the basis of uh, this uh, proceed, proceed model and the social assessment. So now we are uh, going back to the original thing. This is important for you to understand what's, uh, this is the mechanism, this is the engine of, uh, or the concepts behind uh, the proceed, proceed model. But this is what we will really need while implementing our program. So as I say, the social assessment is to gain an insight in the community. So can you tell me how can we gain this insight into the community? Some ideas. Um, tell me the methods. Yeah, it's yeah, one by one. Social mapping. Social mapping? In-depth interview? Observation. Who said observation? Oh, okay. Observation. Focus group discussion. Yeah. Informal interview. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Even participatory rapid appraisal. So, key informal interviews, surveys, community asset mapping. You know, mapping, asset mapping, nominal group process. Do you know what's nominal group process? So, you want me to tell? It's not very much necessary for your course, but nominal group process is um, like you, it, it, it can involves more participation from your respondents. Suppose you have a group of respondents, suppose a group of rickshaw pullers, you ask them to tell what, what are your problems. So everybody is supposed to write one, two or three problems, you know, they, they write it, they don't discuss, they just write or they ask someone to write for them. You collect all of those those responses. You uh, uh, you uh, merge all those common things. You know, you just put it in a in a, uh, in, a in a board, and then you ask them to rank which one is more important. This is called nominal group process. Yes, something like file sorting, something like that, very much like that. Um, then Delphi technique. You know Delphi. Suppose you develop. Yeah, you know somebody. Knows. Okay, Delphi is like you develop a process, uh, I mean a model or something, you pass it around um, uh, the, some, uh, the experts, and you don't do it physically, you do it through mail, because those, person, those people are very uh, busy persons, people, so you email them and ask them to give their inputs, then based on their inputs you change the model, you send it again to them and ask them to again rate it. And then you come to a conclusion. This is a very reiterative process it's called Delphi techniques and focus group that you know. Uh, I guess I'm going a little bit slow. I'll go fast from here. Okay. So the next step is uh, epidemiological assessment. In epidemiological assessment, you try to understand the health status of that community. First, you are try to understand the quality of life. What the thing uh, improves their quality of life. What they perceive to be important for their life, their living. It's not really health. Now we are coming to health because health causes this improved quality of life according to our uh, reciprocal determinism. So now we are into that. So the purpose, again, important, asterisk, to determine for a given target population which health problems measured objectively pose the greatest threat to health and the quality of life. So actually, quality of life is used. Uh, is I shouldn't have written this. 
uh, to uh, get a threat to health. So quality of uh, life is seen in the, in the social assessment. Basically, here you see the health. But it's, it's actually, as I said, reciprocal determinism. One is very much uh, attached with another. That's why it's used. So in the community, you want to see who has the problem, which age group has the greatest burden of disease, gender, ethnicity, geographic region. Uh, suppose in Dhaka city, you want to give an intervention to whole Dhaka city, which is very practical, but suppose you are giving, uh, you will find that uh, the slum dwellers may have high, higher burden of uh, neonatal sepsis, suppose, or any other uh, health condition. So what are the problems? You try to understand the problems in terms of their mortality, years of potential life loss, morbidity, impairment, disability, disability adjusted life year, quality, then Haley or Healy, whatever you want. I mean, you simply want to measure what's there in the community. That's the whole idea. And what could be the, the methods to uh, understand the epidemiological profile of that community? Huh? Surveys, good. Surveys. One by one, one by one. Very good, very good. You just don't jump into um, a research. You first try to see whether if you find some available data because if you want to do research for every step, then you'll be ruined. You know. Uh, so if you try to do, uh, try to find the available data. Anyways, I'm going fast again. Uh, national health statistics with in the statistics. No building side, right? Okay. Then maybe DGHS of uh, or Ministry of Health, uh, local health departments, existing surveys, maybe there are some data in DGHS. And then you can use the research literature. We usually don't do research, but we can do research if the data is not available. You can we can definitely do the survey. Now the third stage is um, to understand the behavioral and the environmental assessment. So what is, as uh, we showed yesterday as well, uh, the diseases are, at least 50% of the diseases are uh, having some behavioral factors behind it, right? So we need to understand what are the behavioral and environmental factors leading to this condition, this problem, this epidemiological um, problems. Why is happening? What are the behavioral risk factors and environmental risk factors? So again, something important. The purpose of this uh, assessment, this behavioral and environmental assessment is to identify most important and most changeable. If you go one by one for behavioral factors, you may come up with hundreds of behavioral factors related to that particular disease condition, but you don't go after all of them. You understand, you, you address most important and the most changeable behavioral and environmental risk factors for a given health problem. So behavioral, there are actually different types of uh, risk factors. Uh, we are dealing with risk factors. We are trying to identify the risk factors now. So the first risk factor can be genetic or biology, which we can change or cannot change. We cannot change. So do we, uh, I mean, um, account for those those things? Genetic. We go for Down syndrome. We try to give some um, genetic intervention to the people having. We don't do that because we can't change the age or pre-existing health condition or gender. Though there are some gender change surgeries uh, very popular in Thailand, <laughs> but uh, we don't go for those things to our behavior change intervention. We don't address these issues. So what do we address? The thing that we can address, which is within our reach, those are the behavioral risk factors, like behaviors or lifestyles of the individuals at risk that contribute to the occurrence and severity of the health problem. So we address the behavioral risk factors and the environmental risk factors. What is the difference between behavioral and environmental risk factors? It's written there. So, beyond personal control yeah. and not amenable to education. So, uh, him, him, he, right? Yeah. So you go, Uti, Uti. This is something different now. <laughs> anyway, so uh, how about Uti? You have Uti in your name? Uti, Uti, Uti. 
Okay, thank you. So, whatever. Uh, so, you go to give some health education, but it won't work. Because, suppose, uh, suppose there is no, uh, the person is a very heavy chain smoker for 30 years, and you ask him to uh, stop the smoking, he will have nicotine withdrawal, right? He, he will have some physical effect. So, he needs nicotine patches, certain medication, but those are not available. So this person, even if that person is willing to do, it's not available. We can't access those services. So this is beyond his reach. Even if you give the health education, it won't work, right? So this is external to the environment, beyond personal control, and not amenable to education. These are the environmental risk factors. Environmental risk factors are usually social, physical, or healthcare related. Uh, mostly, I mean, in most of the cases. So, you try to understand the most important and most changeable behavioral and environmental risk factors for uh, your intervention. So, what would be the uh, methods? What are the methods to identify those risk factors? That's why I refer to you. She always it's a word of briefings very simply and easily. <laughs> so we go for World Health Organization published a report on uh, behavioral risk factors in 2004 or 2005 I forgot. So you can refer to that. It explicitly elaborately discusses about certain diseases and the risk factors associated with those diseases. You can uh, go for certain literature, suppose you want to address New natural sepsis, you can go for searching the literature where you may find uh, uh, the factors associated with behavioral risk factors of new natural sepsis. I mean, not for the new net, for the mothers. Mothers' behavior that may cause new natural sepsis. So, this, these are the things uh, uh, which are usually done. Then, uh, okay, so now suppose the example, this is just a exercise to understand how you go for more most important and most changeable thing. Suppose you are uh, trying to uh, introduce a cardiovascular disease prevention among the youth. So you identify some of the uh, behavioral risk factors like smoking, eating high fat food, medical treatment, they are not taking medical treatment, they are careless about medical treatment, they eat a lot, they, they do not do exercise, don't relax because Stress is one of the factors for uh, cardiovascular disease. So you try to understand what are the most important and most changeable. You don't go for not relaxing. This is something beyond maybe your reach. You know, it's not that important and it's not that much changeable. So you usually try to identify the most important factors and most changeable factors that you can address. And these are suppose smoking, eating high fat food. So you can ask people not to smoke or motivate them not to eat high fat food. Huh? Uh, smoking? Uh, these are, I mean, I think smoking is more difficult to change. Okay, you change it, no problem. It's very arbitrary. Good uh, input from you. So you can uh, add what, Shubha? Uh, what do you want to add there, instead of smoking? You simply uh, exercise. All right, I agree with you. It's more easy to uh, motivate someone to do exercise. I completely agree with you. It's very arbitrary. It's just an example. So we will change it to we will take this copy cut this here and delete smoking. Happy? Okay. So <laughs> next year that will be. <laughs> you come and see. Uh, then the next step is. Educational and ecological assessment. This is um, uh, important uh, because you have these predisposing factors, reinforcing factors, and enabling factors. This is important for you to understand what is predisposing factor, what is reinforcing factor, and what is or what are the enabling factors. Okay. So the purpose of again important. The purpose is to identify those predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors that must be changed to initiate and sustain the process of behavioral and environmental change. 
So you identify the predisposing, reinforcing and enabling factors which are responsible for this behavioral and environmental risk factors, right? You try to identify the predisposing, reinforcing and enabling factors which are responsible for responsible for what? The behavioral risk factors or the environmental risk factors. So behaviors are done or behaviors are practiced by people or exercised by people due to some factors or they don't change the behavior because of some issues surrounding them. So we need to understand. It's called, it's, it, there is a concept of collective causation. Again, I tell you, this is not something important. This is important. And this is also important. You have to understand what is predisposing. Collective causation is all those things that I say, the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors, they collectively influence behavior. It's not that only one factor influences the behavior, the other does not. And these are not mutually exclusive. I mean, it's not that only one factor is responsible and the other is not. Rather, they act frequently, they interact to cause the behavioral uh, problems, like not changing the behavior or practicing a certain